Uh, I know it's been a long, busy day. Uh, quite a few people standing. Maybe you like standing, but there are plenty of seats if you want to have a seat. Uh, yeah, long, busy day. Uh, lots going on. Um, I'm Jerry Stimson, and on behalf of KAC Communications, I'd like to give you a very warm welcome to Warsaw and to this, the sixth Global Forum on Nicotine. We've broken a record. We have over 600 people registered. More than 70 countries are represented. And for the very first time, we had to put up the sold out sign. So you could only get a ticket on eBay if you hadn't got one in time. Um, so here we all are together. Thank you very much for making it here to Warsaw. Uh, together, the KAC communications uh, team and our program committees have designed the foremost international conference on uh, nicotine. This year's theme is it's time to talk about nicotine. It's time to examine why and how people like using nicotine. It's not a conference on tobacco control. It's about tobacco harm reduction and the potential of pr products such as snooze, e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products as safer alternatives to smoking. A lot of misconceptions abound around nicotine amongst many scientists and men, in many tobacco control organizations, among many parliamentarians and governments. What GFN aims to do is to challenge these misconceptions. So GFN continues to grow. We've more speakers. We've got 80 speakers over the next couple of days, and there were a lot of sessions today, and I hope you went to those and enjoyed those. We've got lots of posters. Uh, and uh, a heck of a lot going on, and of course a lot of time to talk with each other. I'm especially pleased that we have many people coming to GFN for the first time, and from parts of the world which haven't been well represented before. So we have a large contingent this year from Africa, uh, which is currently witnessing some interest in harm reduction developments. I'd also like to give a warm welcome to the KAC Tobacco Harm Reduction Scholars, the 25 scholars. Uh, these are the next generation harm reductionists. So you'll see them around, and I think they've got a special scholars badge. So if you see them, please go up to them and introduce yourself because they'd be very interested to hear what you've got to say. GFN is inclusive. Uh, it's an unrivaled platform for the exchange and debate on often contentious issues, and all are welcome here. There are no rules about who can and cannot attend or who can and cannot speak. So all who come here are really committed to do so with an open mind and to examine the evidence when making decisions and judgments. And thanks to you all, GFN is what we say the only place where science and policy meet. So it's a very special place to be, and I'm very pleased to see you all here. Tonight is a special evening. We have our annual lecture, the uh, Michael Russell Oration, followed by the Tobacco Harm Reduction Awards, and followed by the conference social event. So Michael Russell's name comes up a lot. He was a pioneer in the study of tobacco dependence and the development of treatments to help smokers quit. Uh, reasoning that pure nicotine carries little health risk but is the main driver for smoking, Mike advocated the development and promotion of safer nicotine products to reduce the harm caused by ingesting burnt uh, tobacco. And I was very privileged to work in the same uh, research centre as Mike Russell in the 1970s. So we're very grateful to the Russell family for allowing us to name the oration in his memory. And tonight's orator is Dr. Ronald Dawkin. Uh, he, as I said, we, um, there are no rules about who can and cannot attend. So we've got, we always try to get interest in people in here who are kind of a little, little bit out of our normal field. And Ron is, is one of those. He trained as an anesthesiologist began full-time medical practice in the 80s while working on a doctorate in political science at Johns Hopkins University. After getting his doctorate, he split his time between anesthesiology and work as a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, a policy research organization in Washington, DC. 
He's written four books, one on Karl Marx, and I said everybody's welcome here, how Karl Marx can save American capitalism, so we're still waiting for the <laughs> results of that. Uh, he's written a book on St. Augustine, and he's, done, he's written two books on medicine and uh, society. Some of you may be familiar with his recent essay in the American Interest Journal, which was entitled The Arrogance of Public Health and Advocacy. So Ron's work covers American culture and politics and medicine and society, and since 2010 he's taught courses in political philosophy, medicine and society at the George Washington University Honors Program. And he recently left anesthesia to write and teach full time, so interest in transition. So tonight he's going to give the Michael Russell oration on the topic of interests and ideology in harm reduction. Please welcome Ron Dawkin, thank you. Thank you, Professor Stimson. I have come into your lives this evening like a comet out of nowhere. I have not spoken before on harm reduction, nor is my area of research in nicotine. I am here because of the essay I wrote for the American Interest, uh, an opinion magazine on public health and vaping. That essay was a mild defense of vaping, but a pointed criticism of today's public health establishment, at least in the United States. And because of the interest in that essay, I find myself here. And so I thought I would spend the time this evening broadening the scope of what I wrote in that essay and discussing in more detail my thinking behind it. I'd like to begin with a story from my own anesthesia practice. Several years ago, I sedated a very obese man for surgery. Another anesthesiologist came into the room, made jokes about the man's weight, and laughed out loud. When I told my colleague that the man was only half asleep, he grew worried. He feared the man might sue him if he remembered the insult after waking up. And so he asked me to give the man a drug called Versed, which causes amnesia. When I reminded him that the drug causes people to forget things going forward, but not things already said, my colleague bowed his head and left the room I think he'd already lost half his fortune in court. Fortunately, the man did not remember anything after waking up, and my colleague was safe. I tell the story to identify a trend in anesthesiology since its beginnings in the 19th century. Over the years, my specialty has divided the targets of anesthesia into pain, awareness, amnesia, and consciousness. In the past, anesthetic gases such as ether hit all these components almost by scattershot. But over time, Specific drugs came onto market to target select feelings and experiences, with a drug like Versed, for example, targeting memory. This is just a microcosm of what happened in the larger society over the last two centuries. In the past, when people wanted to numb themselves to life's problems, they used alcohol, analogous to the way that anesthesiologists use ether. Alcohol numbed people's minds and gave them relief from all kinds of life problems, again, almost by scattershot. But over time, drug companies eyed the various unpleasant feelings in life that prodded people to drink and divide them into categories, for example, into anxiety, depression, insomnia, and pain, and then, as in anesthesiology, targeted them with specific agents. Those agents were then subdivided and made even more precise. So for example, the drug Versed, which I use in the operating room, is one of 60 drugs that make up the class of Valium-like drugs called benzodiazepines, which are used to treat insomnia and anxiety. When treating insomnia, each benzodiazepine has its own special trick. One form gets people off to sleep immediately. Another form kicks in after four hours to prevent early morning wake up, and so on. An analogous trend occurred in the tobacco world. Centuries ago, when one wanted a lift in mood, or a feeling of calm elation, or a little extra stimulation to focus better, one would smoke tobacco or perhaps drink coffee. As in the case of ether and alcohol, Nothing else is available. But over time, entrepreneurs discovered ways to target the desired sensations more precisely and with fewer side effects. In the case of coffee, caffeine pills are invented. And in the case of tobacco, electronic cigarettes or e-cigarettes are invented. Now, whenever a new product comes into market, it makes already established companies nervous. In the case of e-cigarettes, the tobacco companies and the drug companies that uh, manufacture tobacco substitutes fear they would lose market share and at first they campaigned against the new product. This is how interest groups usually operate. They defend their turf, they dislike change, they expand incrementally, and they operate for the direct and immediate benefit of their members. 
Many public health experts also fought against e-cigarettes. They still do. But unlike the tobacco companies or drug companies, they do not do so for reasons of, uh, they do not do so for profit. They are not worried about market share. They do so for reasons of ideology, I realize. They do so for the sake of a larger political vision. And this realization is what gave me the idea for the essay. What is ideology? An ideology is a belief system adopted by a large number of people over a long period of time, one with an element of hope and aspiration in it. Its goal is to improve people's quality of life somehow. So for example, through more physical security, more material benefits, more happiness, more peace. A single catchword usually sums it up. The catchword may have once been any old word, but associated with an ideology, the word brings to mind an entire worldview when heard. For example, the word diversity has been in the English language for centuries, and during all that time, it meant nothing more than its definition. Now when the word is uttered, everyone knows what it means. It immediately conveys an entire worldview about how society should be organized. Same with the word green. The color has been around forever, but now when the word is spoken, it communicates a whole body of doctrine about how we should live our lives in relation to nature. Ideology has cropped up within the field of mental health. For example, the word neurotransmitters refers to all the little molecules that enable nerves to communicate with one another. But over the last 30 years, the word has achieved popular resonance. It means much more when spoken. When a layperson nowadays tries to explain his or her unhappiness and invokes the word neurotransmitters to do so, the listener immediately knows what it means. The word expresses in capsule form the new belief that unhappiness, as opposed to true clinical depression, is a medical problem more than a life situational problem and something best treated with drugs. Something similar happened with the phrase public health. The phrase has been around for centuries, but over the last few decades, it no longer just describes a field. The word public has become synonymous with the word community, which has become a catchword in its own right. It reflects people's fear of isolation and longing for a world where people come together, a feeling exacerbated by their increased loneliness. In the US, skilled politicians sense to take advantage of this fear, and so they often use catchphrases such as, we need to go back to community or let's build more communities. For similar reasons, whenever pushing a health care plan, whether liberal or conservative, American politicians will typically support public health in their plan because I know the word public is linked in voters' minds with the utopian ideal of community. When voters say, I really believe in public health, what they are saying is that they dislike the medical industrial complex, which to their minds is all about doctors and drug companies making money for themselves rather than putting people first. Not surprisingly, the word community often appears in public health publications, while many departments of public health have subdepartments of community health. When joined to the word public, the word health has its own wider meaning now. Rather than signify just the health of the body, it refers to the health of the body politic, of the community in all aspects, for example, in matters of justice, equality, and social welfare. Hence, public health's expansion well beyond its original portfolio of infectious disease. But because of public health's link to medical science, public health represents the worldview that is through science and the scientific method, rather than through philosophy or politics that such problems can be solved. A whole host of derivative ideas now surface when the phrase public health is uttered. Mental health has become a big part of public health, causing public health to absorb the ideology signified by the word neurotransmitters. Other words such as wellness, lifestyle, and prevention are also linked to public health and have become ideological catchwords in their own right. They are well known to anyone who has observed the American cultural scene over the last few decades. In the past, the word prevention meant sanitation and quarantines. Today, for many people, it is sloganistic shorthand for the right of a lay person to become more involved in his or her health and happiness, to take action before getting ill, and not to blindly take orders from a doctor, or to wait for the medical industrial complex to take control of his or her body. This outlook is laced with a strong distrust of authority. Indeed, there's something rebellious, even revolutionary, in its hostility toward establishment medicine. The word wellness is equally inspirational in a mental health way. When a layperson says, I'm really into public health and wellness, the person is communicating the desire to live healthier, longer, and better without the stresses of modern life. It is associated with the word lifestyle, as in healthy lifestyle, which, when uttered, means living for personal happiness, independent of how the world might judge them. An example of this in everyday conversation might be 
when a man refuses, a man refuses to take a job because, in his words, lifestyle is more important to me. Public health today is home to a wide variety of ideological currents and worldviews that touch on people's hopes and fears. Some of these currents affect politics. I will focus more on how they affect harm reduction and in a negative way. But it's important to understand that public health is no longer just another medical field. It has managed to tap into people's consciousness about what it means to live a good life on many levels. Public health and the word ideas associated with it symbolize a larger and more complex outlook, one that appeals to people's interests, but also to their anxieties about the world around them and their place in it. That public health is turned to a realm of ideology is perhaps best illustrated in the way it has turned science itself into ideology. Let me give an example. Years ago, I attended a social science conference where a public health professor talked about her research. She had visited hospitals and observed several cesarean sections being performed. She noted that the operating table was always tilted to the left during these surgeries, causing the patient's blood to spill onto the nurse's shoes rather than onto the doctor's. She called the sexist and said that things need to change. I raised my hand to say she was mistaken. The professor doubled down and said she had seen this with her own eyes. I replied I was an anesthesiologist with a specialty in obstetrical anesthesia. This obviously came as a surprise to her given the venue. I went on to explain that all C-section patients are tilted to the left because the pregnant uterus compresses the vena cava, which returns blood to the heart and lies slightly to the right of the spinal cord. Because most C-sections are done under spinal anesthesia, which drops blood pressure, the additional drop in blood pressure caused by a compressed vena cava risks dropping blood pressure even more. The leftward tilt prevents this. Now, since most surgeons are right-handed and therefore must deliver a baby while staying on the patient's right side, and at the time most surgeons were men, and since a nurse must therefore stay on the patient's left side to assist, and at the time most nurses were women, what appears to be sexism is actually the consequence of anatomy and physiology. I told the professor her policy recommendation would kill thousands of women. The public health professor had confidence in her conclusion because she had used a scientific method. She had formulated a hypothesis, tested it through experiment, and then analyzed the result to verify her hypothesis. But the scientific method fails in this kind of situation. To push the method blindly, as she had, is not science, but ideology. As public health grows more ideological, this has become a problem. In the 17th century, when while studying the positions of the planets, Sir Isaac Newton used the scientific method to discover the laws of motion. The method remains, remains the basis for all scientific inquiry, but it has defects. First, the method is one of intentional ignorance. It demands that investigators focus on certain chosen details, isolate them, and leave out all the rest. This means investigators reach conclusions by looking at only a small portion of the facts. Second, in isolating such details and supposing such isolation to be accurate, investigators suppose what is false. Third, the scientific method encourages investigators to transcend individual details and to substitute generalizations that are convenient for thought, but which are nothing more than phantoms. The phantoms are then confused with real existence. These limitations explain why the scientific revolution began in astronomy. The scientific method works best when applied to an area we know little about. In astronomy, we make extremely limited observations about stars and other planets. We can talk about them only in the simplest terms. Our ignorance lets us believe we have found the ideal science. For similar reasons, physics and chemistry are the next most perfect sciences. Their scales are so tiny that we can't see most of the details, only general effects here and there. In their experiments, physicists and chemists single out certain observable changes as the main phenomena, when in fact a lot more is involved. The closer we get to our subject and the more we know, however, the more the scientific method breaks down. An astronomer can feel comfortable calling a faraway star's path a line, even though it may curve out there at the edge of the universe. The astronomer can assume the scientific method has revealed the truth, and it will likely never be disproven. But human behavior is a, is a level on which many investigators today work. And unlike faraway stars, human behavior is something we know a lot about. For every one observation made about stars, Poets and philosophers have made millions about people's habits, behaviors, and feelings. All people, trained and untrained, are familiar with life. This is why the scientific method works so poorly on the level of life. Compared to astronomy, we see so much more. We know so many more details, and therefore we can watch the scientific method go wrong. 
Newton warned others not to take the method too far, not to turn it into theology, and his advice was heeded for a time. But as the allure of science and the authority of science grew, many fields of study embraced the method. For example, psychology, economics, political science, public policy, and yes, public health. Practitioners in these fields knew the facts of life were vast and variable from person to person. But rather than satisfy themselves with groping for life's answers through the veil of that reality, they used the scientific method to wander outward, seeking something definite and universal in abstraction. They carved up people into categories and subcategories, thinking that through fragmentation, they would find some deeper truths about life. Public health experts were more prone to doing this than doctors were. Doctors create categories and abstractions too, but they also deal with individual patients, and so they find it hard to disregard the human and the personal. Public health, on their hand, deals with entire populations. Therefore, the urge to generalize and form universal concepts is greater in public health. The tendency to oversimplify and turn the scientific method into theology is greater. Here are just a couple of examples of the scientific method stretched to study the problem of vaping in teenagers, leading to sweeping generalizations. One public health study surveyed 7,000 smaller studies that in turn had surveyed tens of thousands of teenagers to see if vaping led to cigarette smoking. The smaller studies grouped teenagers according to a number of risk factors, such as low self-esteem, depressive behavior, anxiety, and rebelliousness. The authors of the larger study then picked nine of these smaller studies based on the, quote, comparability of the psychopathology, end quote, surveyed in each study. They concluded from their big analysis of their much smaller analyses that vaping among teenagers led to a higher chance of smoking within two years. And for this reason, they recommended tighter restrictions on vaping. Here was their arrogance. The investigators in the smaller studies bundled together certain human attributes and gave them names. For example, anxiety and depression. Now, real people have thousands and thousands of attributes, but the investigators limit the number of attributes so they could form general concepts, the concepts of anxiety and depression. The investigators in the larger study then create a concept out of these concepts, the, quote, comparability of the psychopathology, thereby broadening the generalization while sacrificing more depth. The process is not unreasonable. Well-defined categories make information easier to comprehend and easier to apply to new cases. And as a basic principle of the scientific method, that the fewer the variables, the cleaner the result. But in their quest for universal concepts, the investigators risked abandoning the real article and taking up with a shadow. That is, taking a concept drawn from concepts, which are themselves drawn from a handful of human attributes, declaring that one concept to sufficiently represent reality, and then using that concept to formulate a policy governing the lives of people with thousands and thousands of attributes. A second public health study observed that the same exhalation techniques used to produce smoke rings with traditional cigarettes can be used to make rings of aerosol with e-cigarettes. For this reason, the study concluded, teenagers may acquire cigarette smoking behavior through the use of e-cigarettes, and that this makes a transition to cigarette smoking more natural. The investigators parlayed this point into recommending tighter restrictions on vaping. Here was their arrogance. The investigators stripped off all attributes they thought they saw in one teenager and not another until they found an attribute, namely the ability to exhale, which was common to all teenagers. Now, one relevant form of exhalation is aerosol rings. And since ring, such rings might or might not be made with each exhalation, the ability to exhale and the potential to make aerosol rings became paired attributes that the investigators found useful to class teenagers by. Not because they represented the various teenagers very well, but because they were found in all teenagers. It's like classifying people by their shoes. Not because shoes are a valuable method of classification, but simply because everyone wears shoes of one kind or another. Having thought away all the other qualities of teenagers except the two attributes of exhalation and the potential to make aerosol rings, the investigators tried to explain the transition to cigarettes by these two classifying concepts that were left. They credited these two classifying concepts, exhalation and aerosol rings, with an independent existence and proceeded to derive from them an understanding of why teenagers progress to smoking. In each of these cases, the authors use a scientific method to create a purely intellectual representation of teenage life. In the process, they emptied reality of meaning and turned it into pure generalization, leading them to the edge of sense and nonsense. 
In fact, common sense is the more meaningful guide here. Who here has watched teenagers, or at least been a teenager? All of us. I noted in my essay that a certain percentage of teenagers will partake in vice no matter what. They have been doing so for thousands of years. Is not vaping the safer vice? And if teenagers smoke less today because of public health education and not because of vaping, then why do the rate of teenage smoking remain roughly the same in the U.S. from 2003 to 2013? Was not public health education just as aggressive then? And is it not plausible when I think about my own teenage daughter and her friends that starting in 2013, cell phones and social media became ubiquitous among teens who could not hold a phone and instant message each other for two hours, for three hours, without two hands, which made holding a cigarette impossible, and that this, rather than public health education, led to the drop in smoking? The variables to be considered on this issue are as infinite as the moods of a teenager, rendering the scientific method almost useless here. Public health insistence that the method is definitive, definitive is arrogant and ideological. I want to spend the last 10 minutes talking about ideology and public health for a different purpose, to account for public health's hostility toward vaping. Several years ago, I went to an outdoor party. A man I knew walked off to the side, looking a bit down. I saw him light up a cigarette, and I went over to say hi. He was in a peculiar mood, and he began to open up. He said he had thought he accomplished very little in life. From an outsider's view, it might not appear that way, he said. He'd done this, that, and a number of things. But he alone knew how little it had all amounted to. He puffed on a cigarette and said he wished he'd done things differently. In what way differently, I asked. He took another puff and said he would have married later, maybe traveled more, then gone after things that were hard to achieve, like trying to build a business on the side and not always be putting things off till later. Watching him smoke and regret his past, I thought, yes, all those things you put off vanished into thin air like smoke escaping from a chimney. What did this man suffer from? Life. Why did he smoke? Life. Life is the impetus for the ingestion of most mind-numbing agents. In life, each of us desires lasting happiness, yet each of us knows lasting happiness is impossible. The result in unhappiness, anxiety, pain, or insomnia varies in intensity in any given person on any given day. But for centuries, people have been stupefying themselves with alcohol or drugs to escape some version of the contradiction. Often, the contradiction expresses itself as a kind of discord that people feel between their lives and their conscience, between how they live and how they think they should be living. The exact nature of the discord doesn't really matter. All that matters is that for one reason or another, they are plagued by the inner voice telling them that their lives are wrong in some way. And because they cannot silence life, they silence their conscience by dulling their minds to varying degrees, or at least by giving themselves a calm, pleasant sensation using mind-altering drugs. As I noted earlier, thanks to industry, the drugs we use today are safer and more precise than before. The drugs include psychoactive medication, but also the old drugs, such as alcohol and tobacco, as well as new products like e-cigarettes. The question becomes, why does a public health establishment hate e-cigarettes in particular? And I'm also toward tobacco and heavy alcohol use is understandable since they're unhealthy, but vaping has not yet been proven so. Some argue it is because the free market invented vaping and without public health input. Public health dislikes drugs invented without its input. It also dislikes the free market. Yet antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents were invented by the free market and without public health input. The public health establishment has no problem with them. Indeed, in public health, the treatment of negative feelings with prescription psychoactive medication figures prominently in its portfolio. To understand public health's animosity toward vaping, one has to look closer at its ideologies. I talked to a public health expert about my friend at the party. The expert said, my friend need to be educated about the dangers of tobacco. I told him my friend was a doctor, like me. The expert said a doctor should know better. I said the doctor did, but he couldn't stop smoking. He was unhappy, and smoking made him feel better. The expert asked me why he was unhappy. The usual, I said, he hates himself, his kids hate, his kids hate him, and he fights with his spouse over money. The expert asks, is he eating right? Has he joined a gym? Has he tried meditation? I said I didn't know. Maybe he needs to be on an antidepressant, he, the expert said. Herein lies the origin of, vaping, of public health's animosity toward vaping. 
One public health ideology designed to target everyday and happiness involves wellness and lifestyle. For example, good diet, meditation, and exercise. These simple remedies are portrayed as a reliable solution to the bad feelings that arise from life's disappointments, with the added benefit of being good for one's health. But in truth, they are often fall short in the psychological purpose. Indeed, how many times have I seen people leave a wellness center in my neighborhood, and before they're even in their cars, life has already swamped them with stress and strain, they scream with their spouse or other client on a cell phone. They rush to open their car doors to be, uh, not to be late for the next appointment. Public health's wellness and lifestyle ideology taps into people's hope for a quick and sure route to happiness, and a healthy one at that, one that does not require a fundamental change in how they live and which bypasses medication. Sadly, there is no such route. On the other end of public health's treatment spectrum for everyday happiness lies the ideology of psychoactive medication. Here, contentment is found not in diet or yoga, but in powerful mind-altering drugs that stifle the conscience and make people feel happier, independent of how their lives are actually going. Over the last 30 years, public health has allied itself with medical science to medicalize everyday and happiness, and to blame the happiness on neurotransmitters rather than life. I noted earlier how the word neurotransmitters, like the words wellness and lifestyle, has become a major ideological catchword that symbolizes a popular desire to enjoy a respectable and enduring happiness without much effort. The public health expert said my friend needed to be on a drug. My friend's problem, according to the expert, was that he was on the wrong drug. He was on tobacco when he should have been on an antidepressant. Public health experts make similar recommendations when advising people suffering from opioid addiction. As you know, many Americans today are hooked on opioids. It's a real crisis. Many of these people live in Trump country. They lost their jobs in manufacturing, they lost their houses, they lost their self-esteem, and they spiral down into opioid addiction. But what public health experts often tell these people is that opioids are not the solution. If you lost your job and you feel low self-esteem, you should be on an antidepressant, not an opioid, they say. If you're anxious because you can't pay your mortgage, you should be on an anti-anxiety agent, not an opioid, they say. If you can't sleep at night because you can't find work, you should be on a sleeping pill, not an opioid, they say. Public health experts encourage unhappy people facing difficult life situations to stupefy themselves with powerful mind-altering medications, and they legitimize that stupefaction through appeals to science. They convince people that a drug-induced happy state, which often lasts all day, is respectable because their unhappiness arose from an imbalance of neurotransmitters in the first place. But public health demands this proceed in accordance with its ideology and its medications. That is, not with opioids or tobacco, but rather with antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents. Sitting between public health's emphasis on wellness and its general support for psychoactive medication is life. Plain old life, with all its troubles and disappointments, where people try to get through the day as best they can, with no expectation that a magic activity will fix their unhappiness, and no belief that a prescription drug is justifiable. And this is why public health hates vaping. For vaping, along with alcohol and cigarettes, testifies to the fact that there exists a realm where public health cannot penetrate, where public health is not believed, where public health has no real power, and where ideology falls flat and people see it for what it is. In this realm, ancient custom supplies solutions to people, typically in the form of a little pleasant mind numbing from time to time, not all day, but for 20 minutes here or there, nothing immoral, but nothing moral, Nothing that carries the imprimatur of science, but there's nevertheless tried and true, a drink from time to time, maybe a smoke here and there, a short quick buzz to stifle one's conscience. Here public health can do little. It can encourage people to avoid tobacco and heavy drinking, and it stands on firm ground while doing so, since these are unhealthy. But it cannot do the same with vaping or light drinking, because these have not been proven unhealthy. And since public health uh, avoids attacking light drinking for political reasons, it focuses all its ire on vaping. Vaping threatens public health at its weakest point, ideology. It testifies to the fact that some aspects of life cannot be stabilized, that hope and aspiration are futile, and for science to claim otherwise is irrelevant, even deceitful. Besides helping people quit smoking, vaping has this other purpose of making everyday life a little more agreeable. And this undercuts some of the rationale for public health expansion beyond its original portfolio of infectious disease, sanitation, and quarantines. For public health ventured into the everyday spheres of life thinking, it could establish some permanent equilibrium, for example, in the areas of 
unhappiness, poverty, injustice, or violence, but combining good intentions with a scientific method. But it cannot succeed at this, and for the same reason it is easier to write 10 volumes of philosophy than it is to put one principle into practice. Life is too complicated. In much of life, we are obliged to find our way through an unmapped maze, and the best that many people can hope for is to find moments of rest and relief beneath fragile shelters. The scientific method is as powerless to guide the public health experts in the realm of life as it is, as reason is, to guide the diplomat, the general, or the CEO. Indeed, turning the problem of everyday unhappiness over to public health experts trained in the scientific method is no better than turning world government, uh, world, world government over to a federation of lawyers. The idea may be excellent, but it's impossible to carry out. And for this reason, public health both hates vaping and fears it, because vaping represents the voice of reality. I speak of vaping here not as a form of harm reduction, but as something that will one day become ubiquitous and sit alongside social drinking as one more light, stupefying agent to ease people's everyday tensions. I believe this is vaping's future. For now, both for political and public relations reasons, it is best for the vaping community to focus on harm reduction. Doing so is not a deception. In this area, vaping is life-saving. Vaping helps people stop smoking. It may not be completely benign, but it's safer than tobacco. But thinking more broadly, people will never stop comparing how they live with how they think they should be living. They will never accept their unhappiness as a product of unavoidable circumstances, and they will never stop wishing for their unhappiness to go away. In short, whether you consider them to be acting for good reasons or bad, unhappy people will never stop wanting to stupefy themselves. In the future, when adults ask themselves why thinking about life, is this really everything, or is there something else? Can this be everything? Can this, the life we live, and nothing more, be the reward of all our struggles and energies? And when they conclude, yes, this is everything, they will likely reach for an electronic cigarette in the same way people today reach for a beer. Not out of an ideology, but simply because life is difficult enough as it is, and so why not enjoy a moment of calm in an age-old manner? Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, lots to think about. Neither public health nor vaping will ever be the same again after we've heard your words uh, tonight. And, and I think it's, 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 it's really good to reflect on what you've said because so many of us have been struggling about the hostility to vaping, about the hostility to safer nicotine um, products. And uh, we know it's not arguments about facts and evidence, but it runs much deeper than that. And you've I think indicated some of the ways in which we can think that through. So thank you very much. Okay, now on to the next bit of our evening, which is uh, our awards session. And firstly, the awards given by the International Network of Nicotine Consumer Organizations, or INCO for short. Uh, which is the global umbrella organization representing the interests of nicotine consumer advocacy organizations. And we're very pleased that INCO is always here, that INCO grew out of GFN, and we're always very proud of the work that the consumer advocates do. So I'd now like to invite Julie Wozner, president of INCO, who will present the INCO awards which recognize individuals who have contributed to the struggle for saner laws for safer products. Please welcome Julie. As Jerry said, um, INCO was born here at GFN, and each year the organizers, thank you Jerry and Patty, always make sure that we have a place to hold our general assembly and they ensure that consumers are an integral part of GFN, not merely an afterthought. And we're very grateful for their support. We're also grateful for the privilege of being able to honor advocates here at GFN. Earlier today, our General Assembly um, recognized the work of three consumers 
who have been toiling in the fields for years working hard to provide information to consumers about tobacco harm reduction. Um, and I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge um, and thank Julio Rodas, Robert Ennis, and Andy Morrison for their years of volunteer work um, and the important role that they've played in building the consumer THR mov movement. This evening, INCO is conferring its Outstanding Advocate Award. Um, we award one in the consumer category and then one for the professional category. The Consumer Outstanding Advocate is awarded to a consumer who has consistently gone above and beyond in supporting the rights of others to choose safer nicotine alternatives and whose enthusiasm, knowledge, and actions have contributed, making a significant difference at a local, regional, and or global level. This year's recipient of the Outstanding Advocate Award in the consumer category is Mr. Joseph Maguero, the Chairman of Campaign for Safer Alternatives. So I'm going to make him stand up here while I praise him for a second. Come on up. Come on up. I'm going to give you the podium in a second. Um, Mr. Maguero is the former director of Africa Tobacco Free Initiative, um, and he promoted and implemented traditional tobacco control policies during those years. Despite some successes, he realized that overall smoking rates in Africa remained stubbornly static, and in some areas were actually increasing. Research, direct engagement with consumers, ex-smokers, scientists, um, led him to question whether there might be some alternatives. And that rethinking led him to believe that um, vapor products and other safer nicotine products might provide a vital addition to reducing smoking-related diseases. And in 2018, he formed the Campaign for Safer Alternatives, which advocates for the adoption of tobacco harm reduction policies in Africa. We're honoring him, however, not only for his important work in Africa, but also for his personal courage and integrity in embracing tobacco harm reduction as an ethical choice for consumers, even though it put him at odds with traditional tobacco control in his region. For valuing lives and honest public health more than personal gain, he is truly an outstanding consumer advocate. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll just take a short um, minute. Uh, my name is Joseph, as you've heard. Um, I'm very grateful that I'm even noticed, and I'm, this is my first time in Warsaw. I want to thank uh, Brief uh, Inco for their support. Uh, I want to thank also uh, uh, Jerry and KAC for the tremendous support that they've been giving me. Uh, Greg Conley as well. We are a group of advocates in Africa where we face a lot of hostility in a, in a continent that has 77 million smokers. And uh, safer alternatives are there, but unfortunately we're not allowed to speak about them. So I do everything I do out of voluntary work. Nobody pays me to do what I do. Those of us that have been smokers like myself know that these products are a miracle and I, I, I personally won't stop talking about them. I keep blogging about it and approaching um, government officials about this issue and we are breaking ground. So thank you very much once again. So I mentioned we have two awards. Um, this year's INCO Outstanding Advoc Advocate Award um, in the professional category really requires no introduction. Um, Constantinos Varselinos. Um, his work over the years has extended the field of knowledge, understanding, and research relating to the vapor products and tobacco harm reduction area. No one has done more than Dr. Varselinos to advance honest and ethical research that is genuinely useful to consumers. He is fearless. He goes out there, he, he corrects misinformation, he battles with the FDA, and he's honest. We value that research, but we also value your willingness to speak for, to policymakers, legislators, regulators, and other in decision-making positions to explain the science and to support rational THR policies across the world. Your work has been prolific and invaluable, and we're truly grateful for all that you've done for the consumers over the year. 
You've earned our trust, our respect, and our gratitude for your tireless work, and it is truly an honor to be able to publicly recognize you this evening with INCO's Outstanding Advocate Award. Dr. Constantino Garzalinos. Can I give you a hug? That's my speech. Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, I want to thank not only INCO, but also the consumers who introduced me into this controversial but exciting field. The Greek vapors from, uh, first of all, two of my friends who were smokers and uh, sent me a picture one day in late 2011 with themselves holding an e-cigarette. And my reaction was that you just wasted your money and I can prescribe you some Varenicline to quit. Uh, of course, they never got the Varenicline. And I want to thank the Greek vapors from uh, the first internet forum that I managed to find at that time. And I asked for some of them to come to the hospital and participate in my first clinical trial when we were uh, checking the cardiac function, comparing e-cigarettes with smoking. Uh, I want to thank them not only for their participation to various research uh, that we've done, projects, but also because they educated me. It's a product that you need to be educated about. It's a field that you need education. No one is born educated. And I'm grateful because they were the reason that I started uh, working and I started my career in this field. So thank you very much to all consumers. Thank you. And now for the uh, final award tonight, which is the Michael Russell Award, again given with the, uh, um, very th grateful to the Michael Russell family for allowing us to give the Michael Russell Award. Uh, this will be presented by uh, Maroa Glover, director of the rather lengthy named Center of Research Excellent Indigenous Sovereignty and Smoking, Smoking based in Auckland. So that's a good one, that. So, uh, Mara, uh, 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 that focuses, as the title says, it focuses on tobacco use amongst indigenous people globally. Very important centers. So, Mara, uh, please come up. Okay. Oh, that's, uh, well, congratulations, uh, you guys. Um, totally deserved and what a fantastic Michael Russell oration uh, that will keep us going for another year. <laughs> well, um, tonight I have the honour of uh, handing out and announcing the Michael Russell Award recipient. The Michael Russell Award recognises champions who epitomise the spirit and commitment to solve what is one of the greatest challenges facing public health, how to help people stop smoking, and beyond individuals, how to help populations stop smoking. This year's recipient has over 40 years' experience leading many studies and research centres, teaching and mentoring another generation who will continue the work, challenging at a national and international level the continued quest to improve upon what we thought we knew, to do better, to relook at nicotine, tobacco, and our outdated models and theories. I suspect he's learned how to clone himself, and I have actually seen him attend two meetings at the very same time, quite recently. And uh, his CV extends to over 85 pages. He has over 300 publications and many awards. The people who nominated him, and thank you very much for doing so, noted that he is a trusted, brave thought leader. He is vocal and courageous, and we certainly need bravery and courage at this time, given the threats to tobacco harm reduction around the world. 
He is a force behind and supporting more people, groups and organisations than I know than you could possibly know. As a clinical psychologist, he learned by listening to his clients, by reflecting on the efficacy of his counselling, that one solution, one approach, does not work for everyone. Like Michael Russell, tonight we celebrate and honour a mentor, a colleague, and a deeply compassionate human who is lending the full weight of his immense intellect and his influence to having tobacco harm reduction become a norm, in fact, a non-issue at all. The connection to Michael Russell goes deeper than a shared career focus, passion, service and leadership though. Our awardee is significantly to him also South African. It is my great honour to announce the recipient of the Michael Russell Award for 2019. It is Professor David Abrams. Well, thank you so much. Um, uh, I want to just thank the committee and all the people who nominated me, and um, I'm very grateful and humbled. Um, my sense is that I do very little but try to enable others. Um, and the bottom line is um, something from New Zealand, um, he tang yata, he tang yata, he tang yata, which means it's about the people, the people, the people. And um, I now understand from Marawa and others that the nyang part, hmm? nya. the nya part, has a super spiritual meaning about the ethics. And I take that to go to the issue of human rights and social justice. And I think the talk Dr. Dworkin gave is very apropos of the essence of this. Um, it's about people who have the right to make decisions for themselves and how they manage the complexity of life. Some do it better than others. And who are we to judge? And if you truly listen to what people need and want, you would care about alternative nicotine products that are so dramatically safer that it's a tectonic shift that we haven't seen um, since people first started using tobacco and nicotine. And certainly it's a disruptive technology that for the first time in about 120 years could literally replace and make moot the death and disease primarily caused by the invention of the cigarette rolling machine in the 1880s. This is the first true um, technology that could eliminate, and I believe will eliminate to the largest degree, most of the long-term chronic heavy tobacco smoking that's responsible for the death and disease. But people do need to manage their lives and their stress in a non-stigmatized way. And um, I, I am actually quite angry and embarrassed and ashamed of my association with public health in the same way that I grew up in apartheid South Africa and just felt so horrible about being white and knowing what was happening in that country. Um, it's about the people, and uh, it's about human rights. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to have tried to tell the truth about nicotine and tobacco, and, and also the complexity that, that nicotine um, can actually be a very positive coping mechanism for the brain. 
And it's horrible that people have been brainwashed into thinking that even clean nicotine is an addictive behavior that ought to be eliminated and gotten rid of. There are so many smokers and probably vapors in this room that still think and hope someday, what's wrong with me? I still can't stop my nicotine. And I would say there's nothing wrong with you. You're learning as we all do, and I think alcohol, marijuana, and, and nicotine, especially in a safer form, are perfectly okay from time to time. So before I end, I, I have two anecdotes to tell. Um, one is, um, as a clinician in a hospital many, many years ago, and Ray Nayara was there um, in, in Providence, Rhode Island, I was called in to a consultation with a person who'd had a second MI heart attack, who was told to quit smoking the first heart attack and came back three years later with a second MI and had not been able to quit. And we did not have e-cigarettes then and NRT didn't work well for him. He tried everything. And it turns out that he was um, a fitter and turner on a lathe that worked for a aerospace company that may, and he had such an incredible skill of precision and accuracy in his psychomotor and concentration that he had been given a special room with a lathe because they only trusted him to make the fuel injection needles for the F-16 fighter under contract with the government which had to be at very minute tolerances that almost nobody else could achieve because there was still a human element to running the machine. And he basically said, I'd rather die at my lathe a two-pack-a-day smoker. I know all of why you know, I'm, I've had a second heart attack because I'm a patriot to this country because I've tried to stop smoking and I can't operate that machine at the level expected of me unless I have nicotine in my brain. And we actually know from neuroscience that that's accurate. Um, there are actually military studies in the 30s, 40s, and 50s that show nicotine improves attention, concentration, but also speed of information processing without errors. And it can give people in critical decision making the edge to do it a little better. Um, and you could argue what's wrong with that if it doesn't kill you. So I, you know, I would say to all people that have switched from smoking to vaping, it's okay. Um, it probably won't kill you. There are safer and safer vaping products. And um, it's good enough if you need it to cope. Um, the stigma shouldn't be there. Uh, so I'll, I'll end with that. It's just very humbling to think it's about the people and how arrogant we all are to think we would know what somebody needs and wants without talking to them, listening to them, and seeing the unique humanity of why people do what they do by listening deeply and understanding where they're coming from before we make our arrogant public health and other uh, judgmental prescriptions, and in so doing, diminish ourselves and them, and create the us versus them dichotomy that, that I'm ashamed to, to see what's happened in tobacco control. Uh, we are blowing the biggest opportunity to save lives that I've seen and that I think has occurred in, since, the, since the use of tobacco in any form, and we're blowing it. We're absolutely ruining the opportunity to move people towards safer forms of recreational use of nicotine. Even the word recreational is a bad word that the tobacco control community doesn't want us to even utter. Um, that's just wrong. So thank you very much, I'm really honored, and I also want to thank all my colleagues over the years, because the, the truth is I'm, I'm not as smart as they are, and they've guided me, um, particularly Ray and I are, and I, I won't name all the other people, but Ray and I have been colleagues and collaborators um, for 
almost the 40 years that I've been in this field, and we stimulate each other. Um, I wouldn't be perhaps so arrogant as to say we're kind of like Kahneman and Tversky, but, but I think we are in some ways for, for nicotine. And, and without the focus of, of uh, people at Penny Associates, Ray, and many, many others who I've worked with, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing. I'm truly a, a team scientist. And I remember a, a quote, again, from my British background. Um, I think it was Sir Robert Hooke who invented the spring and the elasticity formula. And I think he said once, you, you may know this, um, but he said something to the effect, and I think he was thinking of Isaac Newton, but, but he was saying something like, in order to see a little further, one has to stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think that that's really part of this, is, is we're all part of humanity and we build on each other and, and do our little bit to make life a little more pleasant and to save lives from, from unnecessary death and disease where we can. So um, thank you very much. Congratulations, David, and thank you, Mara. I mean, this has been a, a fantastic session. It's really a pity that it comes to an end because I'd really have liked to have heard everybody speaking so much and given their personal reflections on what they've done and why they've done it. But it must come to an end. It's now nearly time, nearly time, for the conference social event to which you're all invited. It's in the same block uh, as um, the Marriott. There should be, a, our photographer went out this afternoon to take a photo to show you where you're going to go. Uh, there will be conference staff uh, from here, go downstairs to the um, lobby and there'll be conference staff who are leading the way or pointing you the way to go. There's a way of walking through the passageways from here to the Sphinx um, uh, restaurant. But before you go, a little advertisement. Uh, KAC Communications, is starting a new tradition of supporting a chosen charity each year. And the chosen charity this year is the UK New Nicotine Alliance. And so what we're doing is that NNA is organizing a raffle, a lottery, uh, and tickets will be on sale at just 25 zloty. That's not a lot of money for each ticket. And of course, most of you are going to buy lots of tickets because you want the chance to win a free registration for GFN 2020 and three nights in the Marriott to the value of about 600 pounds. So that's the first prize. And the second prize is um, 100 pounds in cash. And there are lots of other prizes which probably will appeal more to vapors and snus users and other people which have been donated. So if you don't use them and you win one of those, you can always give it to somebody else. And we'll, we'll draw the lucky winner tomorrow evening during the networking reception uh, tomorrow evening. So you'll see uh, NNA people going around badgering you to buy raffle tickets and you're going to buy lots of raffle tickets to make this a success for the NNA. So that's it. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you to all the speakers and everybody who's participated on the platform. Enjoy the party. Thank you. <laughs>